Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by a grant from New Mexico Tech on the frontier of science and engineering education. For bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. degrees, New Mexico Tech is the college you've been looking for. 1-800-428-TECH. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Ladies and gentlemen, we learned this week of the passing of Stuart Udall, Cabinet Secretary of the Interior under Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. Called by some the father of the environmental movement, his stewardship of public lands resulted in the Wilderness Act, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Clear Air and Clean Water Act, and more. This historic interview was conducted with Stuart in his home and aired in August 2007. We offer it in tribute to a great visionary American. I'm Lorene Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Stuart Udall. Thank you for joining us. Glad to be with you again, Lorene. Yes, it's always a pleasure. Uh, for our viewers, I want to kind of recap a little bit about your career so they know where to place you in the historical context. You were the state representative from Arizona for several years. You were the cabinet secretary for the interior under Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. You've written, what, nine, ten books? and you've been involved in many, many environmental, ecological, and humanitarian projects. So I'm honored to have the time with you. Uh -huh. let's, well. let's start with um, some of the, the, your recent activities, because this year marks the 100th year anniversary of the birth of Rachel Carson. You spoke at an event at the Kennedy Library. Tell us, uh, let's talk about Rachel Carson. Well, I, I had... Uh uh, two accidents with ice. <laughs> One involved breaking my leg and the other involved a concussion. And uh, that almost ruined my year. But I was invited by the Kennedy Library to come to uh, Boston, to the library, and help celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of Rachel Carson who was the founder, I believe she inspired the beginning of the, what we call the environmental movement. And that was the major event that I have done this year. And I was very pleased to do it because I knew Miss Carson. Uh, I championed her, President Kennedy uh, avoided, uh, appointed a special environmental group to study her book, Silent Spring, and they backed her up that it was essentially sound from a scientific standpoint. So that uh, has been my major activity this year, is getting ready, reading about Rachel, getting ready to give a speech at the library. Well, you are the one who gave her the title uh, as mother of the environmental movement, even though it officially started later. But he, her work is what got, got the awareness for the environmental moving go, movement going, don't you think? Well, I, I, I prefer to say she inspired by her writing the beginning of the environmental movement. And I ought to know because I was there and it changed the way in my department and in the government eventually. It took a few years for us, this to permeate into the thinking of people. But that book was a sensation and it ultimately uh, uh, was translated into 32 languages. And it was not just a U.S. book about uh, birds and DDT, a, a powerful pesticide. It was a book about the future of the planet. It was a, a, a I, I call her a, a scientist who was a prophet because the environmental movement was built on the foundation of the conservation movement, but it was broader than that. And, and she saw that the whole planet would be in danger 
if we didn't restrain some of the powerful new technologies like nuclear explosions and uh, the use of pesticides. Uh, those were merely examples. And uh, this, uh, this is, I believe, is the most influential, or one of the three or four most influential science books of the 20th century. And she is on the list at the end of, of the, at the beginning of the year 2000, Time Magazine put out a list of the 100 most, most influential people in the century. And there she is, Rachel Carson, with her book, yeah. Silent Spring. We, she also was a gifted writer and one of the best na nature essayists, because her essays, The Sea Around Us, and all of that were just such wonderful reading. But when she came in with Silent Spring, and the image of that title, that here is you know a morning in the world, and yet the sound that we always associate, the chirping of birds, suddenly that's gone. And the power of that emotional image and her impeccable science is what helped propel it. Well, the, 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 she said, in effect, we've got to change our way, our attitude and our way of thinking about the planet. That was her message. And, and uh, she was the first one to say that. We began in my department uh, a, a different form of planning uh, conservation was a wonderful movement, but it was f focusing on managing the forests, for example, mm -hmm. or managing a national park. R Rachel Carson said, we've got to think about and exercise restraint in what we do. Uh, 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 think of the planet and its future. And what is global warming today? She didn't prophesy the global warming crisis of the 21st century because enough research hadn't been done. We weren't measuring the carbon in the atmosphere, but that is the type of thing that she was a prophet, really. That's what she was. And she warned against our kind of intoxication with technology, that we had these chemicals that could wipe out every pest and that we had this atomic energy. Uh, in, in a way, you have spoken that you were both children of the atomic age because you both came to intellectual maturity at the time of the atomic weaponry, and yet, and now it's winding down. Talk about the, well, let's talk about your book, The Quiet Crisis, because her book, Silent Spring, was 1962, but in 1963, you came out with your book, and I just want to hold up, although this has no bright, colorful cover, this is the first copy of your first book, 1963, The Quiet Crisis. Tell us about it. Well, I, I, uh, that was the first book I'd ever written. I'd never taken a writing course, but I, I, I worked in my spare time. Uh, and uh, my book came out a year after Rachel Carson's book, uh, but I finished it uh, several months before it came out. So. I didn't have an opportunity in that book, and I sought out the opportunity later when I, 25 years later, I brought the book up to date by a book called The Quiet Crisis and the Next Generation. And there I paid tribute uh, to what Rachel had done. And the word ecology did not, it was a, a specialized world word that a few biologists understood, and, and she made it part of our common language. And she said, we have to plan uh, what we do with technology. We have to restrain it. Uh, and if we don't, we'll destroy part of life and, and, uh, and make it much more difficult for us to live with the other animals and creatures of the earth that we share the earth with. So that moment in time, the early 60s, um, when you look at what you did um, as cabinet secretary for the Inter interior, the, the, the I, I have to go to my notes for this, but um, the clean, clean air, clean water, the Clean Water Restoration Act, the Wilderness Act, you preserved 10 million acres of land. 
Well, it, it's interesting because President Kennedy's initial program was, world, was getting a wilderness bill, saving the national seashores that l were uh, left, uh, and doing more to save birds and wildlife uh, of all kinds. And that, that was the old conservation. Rachel Carson said, look, look broader. Look at the planet itself. We're going to use technology, the power of technology, to alter the Earth as an environment, and this will do great damage. In fact, she was warning us that we should be careful with what we did. Well, if you call it the old ecology, it was still like the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act was under your watch, the Endangered Species Act. There was this like burst of, of conservation in the highest form of the word. And another thing that I've, I've heard you speak about before, back then it was bipartisan. The Republicans and Democrats worked together to save the rivers and the seashores. How long did that last? Well, it lasted essentially 20 years. And President Nixon was a good environmental president. Uh, and I want to see that he gets credit for that. President Ford, uh, was it was bipartisan. We all worked together. We all, we never had fights about any of the conservation or environmental issues that you mentioned. Uh, and uh, we kind of hit a stone wall. Uh, President Reagan wanted freedom for people to do whatever they felt they needed to do, and, and that changed the attitude of some people. But the environmental movement is more important today than it ever has been in the past. No, I just want to stay with our historical context for a minute, because you were very close with First Ladies. And since we've recently lost um, our wonderful Lady Bird Johnson, I wanted to show a picture here of you and Lady Bird, and I'd like you to tell us a little about it. Well, th this is a, a, a Lady Bird uh, took conservation and, and natural beauty as her uh, issue. And that was our first trip. That's in the Teton, on the Snake River in the Teton National Park. And uh, uh, she had a, by her background in Texas, she had a strong interest in conservation and natural beauty. And, and she did, uh, uh, by her uh, activities, the program she started, uh, she did a lot to make our country a more beautiful place. And she started a wildflower institute uh, and it still exists today, and they give uh, uh, seeds, wildflower seeds, to organizations all over the country. Now, Lady Bird was a influential first lady. I will always believe that Lyndon Johnson might not have climbed the ladder all the way he did if she had not been there as his advisor, because when he went home, if he had made mistakes, she talked to him about it. I know that is a fact. <laughs> so you would go off on trips together to, to various parks, wilderness areas? Well, it changed over time. Our, our first trip, for example, uh, we went to the Grand Tetons. Uh, we went to an Indian reservation. She became interested in Indian arts and what was happening here in Santa Fe with the Institute of Indi uh, Indian Arts. And uh, she became interested in historic preservation. Uh, we uh, dedicated the Point Reyes National Seashore, a marvelous place that had been created uh, while President Kennedy was still president. And uh, we did trips on historic preservation, on fisheries, and wildlife, and 
she took up this cause and she had a way if she called the head of the Federal Highway Administration and said she thought that they ought to make changes, the changes were made, I can tell you, <laughs> because I participated with her in some of those projects. And um, you were also close with Jackie Kennedy, too, weren't you? Well, I, I, I think I was fortunate uh, that both first ladies, their ages were different, their backgrounds were different, uh, uh, but uh, I and my wife, Lee, uh, had a close personal relationship with both of them, and uh, it was almost as though I was, part of my job was being a helper to the first ladies to do, uh, to accomplish the goals that they wanted to achieve. Now you served as cabinet secretary for the interior under both Kennedy and Johnson, but if it's not too painful, I'd like to talk to you a little about that transition time because I know that the day that Kennedy was assassinated, you and six other cabinet members were in a plane flying to Japan, and then suddenly you got the news. Well, this, this came, this was Air Force One, one of the president's plane. It was a jet plane by then. We're talking about 1963, of course. And it came on the ticker that the president had been shot. That was the first message. And uh, uh, we were all stunned. And of course, within a matter of minutes, they confirmed that he had been killed and we turned the plane around and came home. Uh, and th that was a great tragedy and the nation was caught up in it. One of the things that I, uh, th these conspiracy theorists, you know, m most of the people don't believe <laughs> that th we know the truth about Kennedy's assassination. Uh, and, uh, and they, they think there was some kind of conspiracy. I, I, I don't, I read the Warren report. I, I knew a lot of the people uh, and I think he was hit by a lucky shot by- uh, The lone gun By man. Oswald. Yeah. So while you all were stunned and trying to make this, um, to accommodate this, the the horrificness of this tragedy, um, the new President Johnson was then interviewing people who was going to stay on his cabinet. What was it like? Since Were you already close with Lady Bird then? No, who no, no, I was not. And, and I had helped Kennedy get the nomination, and the Johnson people thought they had Arizona nailed down, and they didn't. Yeah. And so, uh, I was caught in a crossfire, and I was the last person. President Johnson made a wise decision. Keep the cabinet. He said, let us continue. Yes. That was a, a, a smart thing that he did. Uh, uh, but I was the last person President Johnson had in the White House, uh, and I went in like a lamb. Uh, uh, because I, I knew that he had remembered that I hadn't supported him in, in the uh, 1960 election. And he made it clear that he hadn't forgotten. Uh, that you were a but, Kennedy person, but, uh, yeah. He said, go out and tell them I want to have the same relationship that Franklin Roosevelt had with his interior secretary I want oil out of the White House. And the reporters, I went out and told them that, and the reporters always thought for a long time that this was just window dressing, but he meant it. He wanted oil out of the White House, and I took on the modest oil responsibilities of that time. But. Oil responsibilities are one thing. You also really manifested the uh, environmental agenda of the Great Society. You know, between you and Johnson together, there were so many 
issues, so many national parks, so many environmental bills that were passed. You know, it was really well, a major accomplishment. Uh, well, uh, Johnson, uh, President Lyndon Johnson, I always uh, said, I believed that at the time, uh, that he, he was not a southerner. He was a westerner. He was from the hill country, and he didn't have the attitude of, the, of racial prejudice and racial discrimination. And Lady Bird certainly didn't have it, I can tell you that. But uh, uh, he wanted to carry on what Kennedy had started and do even better. That's the way Johnson was. And, and he, he I, I sort of had a, a blank check that anything that I wanted to do, uh, he was willing to support. I, n I never lost an argument with President Johnson on a conservation issue. Well, and then let us just say a little prayer for Lady Bird. We lost her this year, and um, what a, how lucky you were to have that, that interface with those two great, great leaders of our country. Oh, well, Lady, Lady Bird, uh, there are one woman stands out in our history uh, as an important first lady, and that's Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. There'll never be anything uh, uh, like her, uh, and the influence she had with her husband. But uh, Lady Bird Johnson and Jackie Kennedy both were, uh, they had strong views and they expressed them, and uh, they accomplished some of the things that they wanted to see done. And I think that was important. And with back to Jackie Kennedy for a minute, her, her image of Camelot, of this um, kingdom ruled by a, a beneficent king and doing everything for, for the good of the citizens, that was a really golden, wonderful time in American well, history. Well, it, it, it was, uh, you see, what Jack Kennedy's election represented uh, is uh, something different. All of the, you, you couldn't really seriously run for president unless you were a white Anglo-Saxon wasp. Uh, and Kennedy broke that tradition. He, he was the first Catholic uh, elected. And that was a very powerful message. He just barely did it, but, but he, uh, uh, he, he, but he, uh, Kennedy was also the first president of my generation, the president that was born in the, in the 1920s or earlier than that. Uh, he, was, he was the first president that came out of the war to be elected president. That, that, that war. And also he was a, a president who embodied so much hope for the future. It was a very optimistic time. Kennedy uh, inspired people. Uh, and that was one of his gifts. He, he made wonderful speeches. He backed good causes. He certainly did it where I was concerned. And, uh, and he was on the way to being one of our most memorable presidents. And of course, President Johnson, what he did to the civil rights and other things, he made a, a high mark. But I, I, I don't divide them. They, they had a lot of the same convictions as it turned out on civil rights and other issues, women's rights. It, it, it began in the 1960s, uh, and uh, uh, people shouldn't forget that, that this was, it was a turbulent time. A lot of, a lot of people uh, just think of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of the, the anti-Vietnam War, 
Well, that sort of took over as a wave at the end of the Johnson presidency, but there was a good feeling in the country before that division on the war came forth. How did you feel about Johnson's decision not to run again? No, I, I, I thought he made the right decision. And, uh, uh, and I, I, I'm sure Lady Bird Johnson uh, knew that he was not going to run again. I happen to have information that, because I know she was working on a speech as to, or on a statement as to what she was going to say when he decided not to run. But he made the right decision, and, uh, and uh, I praised it at the time, and I still think that he, that he made the right decision. I so appreciate that we can take the a historical perspective on this. And these are some of my most fascinating political figures, and I'm so grateful that you can tell us about them. I want to move to a non-political figure, if we could take a moment to talk about Robert Frost. This is a picture. Tell us a little about this picture, if you would. Well, this is a picture of the dogwoods in Dumbarton Oaks Park in Washington. And uh, Robert Frost and I are going to a meeting where uh, we're going to talk about the 100th anniversary of the uh, death of Henry Thoreau. Oh. <laughs> and and uh, uh, those are the sort of things we did uh, during the noon hour. Uh, and uh, Justice Douglas was one of the speakers. He was a great admirer of Thoreau. Uh, and Robert Frost spoke and I spoke and a few others as well. But you had a friendship for many, many years, didn't you? Well, we had formed a friendship with Frost in 1959, and, and we sort of became his advocates and sponsors. And I made the suggestion to President Kennedy that he invite Frost to be on the inaugural program. And Kennedy decided to do it, and it, it set the whole tone uh, that there was something new, and we were going to honor the artists and, uh, and the poets and others. And, and that was part of the mood change of the time that I thought and think still was very important. Well, thank you so much for right. your time today. Our guest today is Stuart Udall, former Cabinet Secretary of the, In of the Interior under Presidents uh, Kennedy and Johnson, prolific author and great humanitarian. Thank you for joining All us right. today. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Lorreen Mills. I'd like to thank you for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been watching an interview taped with the late Stuart Udall, which originally aired in August 2007. It is the first in a two-part series. The second part will air next week. Thank you. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by a grant from New Mexico Tech on the frontier of science and engineering education. For bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. degrees, New Mexico Tech is the college you've been looking for. 1-800-428-TECH. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.